Hi guys, so Jason Matthew here again and today we're going to be looking at Neuroscience 3 Cholinergic Synapse. So we have already done Neuroscience 1 and Neuroscience 2. In Neuroscience 1 we looked at the structure of the neuron and in Neuroscience 2 we looked at the resting potential, action potential, refractory period, transmission of action potentials and the speed of an action potential. So I would strongly recommend before going to Neuroscience 3, which is today's class, you visit the YouTube channel and you look at Neuroscience 1 and Neuroscience 2. So in today's class, Neuroscience 3, we're going to be looking at a few things. We're going to be looking at synapses, generally chemical and electrical. And then we're going to be focusing on acetylcholine, which is ACH. Uh, we look at the signal transmission at a, at a synapse. Um, synthesis and recycling of acetylcholine. We will spend some time on the acetylcholine receptors and we will briefly look at certain toxins that affect the cholinergic synapse. So let's talk a little bit about the synapse, um, a little bit on the synapse. Uh, in 1897, Sherrington coined the term synapse to mean a junction of two neurons. The cell that transmits the signal is referred to as the presynaptic cell, and the cell receiving the signal is called the postsynaptic cell. So again, the presynaptic cell is the cell that is transmitting the signal, and the cell that is receiving the signal is called the postsynaptic cell. The space between the presynaptic and postsynaptic cell is referred to as a synaptic cleft. Together, these three components make up the synapse. So again, the presynaptic cell, postsynaptic cell, and synaptic cleft, all three of them make up the synapse. So another point to make here is that the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell, they don't make um, physical contact with each other. There's a small space between the two of them, all right? And we call that space the synaptic cleft. It's around, on average, about 50 nanometers apart. So neurons can form synapses with themselves, with other neurons, and with many other kinds of postsynaptic cells, including muscle and endocrine cells. The synapse between a motor neuron and a skeletal muscle cell is termed the neuromuscular junction and today that's the one that we're going to be focusing on. But there are different types of CNS synapses. You have the axodendritic synapse and that's when the postsynaptic membrane is on a dendrite of another neuron. You have the axosomatic synapse when the postsynaptic membrane is on the soma of another neuron and you should know from neuroscience one, what is the soma? And you, and you should be saying that, yes, that is the cell body of the neuron. So the soma is the cell body of the neuron. You have an axoaxonic synapse, and that's when the postsynaptic membrane is on the axon of another neuron. You have the dendrodendritic synapse, when some dendrites of some specialized neurons form synapses with each other. Uh, you have a symmetric synapse, that's when the postsynaptic and presynaptic membranes are similar in thickness. This type of synapse is usually inhibitory. And lastly, you have the asymmetric synapse, and that's when the postsynaptic membrane of a synapse is thicker than the presynaptic membrane. This type of synapse is usually excitatory. But there are different types of synaptic transmission. The two main types would be electrical and chemical. Electrical synapses are relatively less common than the chemical synapses in the mammalian nervous system. So for the purpose of these lectures, we're going to be looking and concentrating on the chemical synapse. But let's just briefly look at the both of them. This is a, a electrical synapse and this is a chemical synapse. And it is the chemical synapse that we are going to be focusing on. So let's read a little here. In an electrical synapse, the electrical signal is directly transmitted 
from the presynaptic cell to the postsynaptic cell via gap junction. So this here will be your gap junctions, all right? And in B now, which is the chemical synapse, the electrical signal in the presynaptic cell, which would be this guy here, is converted to a chemical signal in the form of a neurotransmitter. So that's the neurotransmitter, these little triangles here are neurotransmitter in the vesicles and they're being released. So the neurotransmitter is being released on the presynaptic neuron. It's going, over, it's going across the synaptic cleft onto receptors that are on the postsynaptic neuron. All right, and you hear, lastly, the receptor converts the chemical signal to an electrical signal in the postsynaptic cell. So acetylcholine, and we'll abbreviate acetylcholine as ACH, and its targets of interaction have played a long-standing and critical role in the basic concepts of neurochemistry. At the turn of the last century, acetylcholine emerged as a pivotal mediator in chemical neurotransmission and as a ligand for defining receptors. So acetylcholine is widely distributed in the nervous system. It subserves all motor transmission in vertebrates. Is the primary transmitter for peripheral ganglia, mediates parasympathetic actions of the autonomic nervous system, and is a dominant transmitter in the central CNS. Toxins from various predatory species have evolved to block motor activity of prey. Others from coral and plants use paralysis induced by cholinergic agents for protection from predation. Predation. The high affinity and selectivity of these toxins enable the, and this here, NACHR, that stands, that's the abbreviation for the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So when we go later on in the podcast, you will see that acetylcholine has two major types of receptors. And the one we're talking about here is the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And these are found um, on neuromuscular junctions. All right, so the high affinity and selectivity of these toxins enabled the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor to em emerge as the first chemically characterized neurotransmitter receptor. Other toxins from snakes and snails have proved useful to identify receptor subtypes in various tissues. In Alzheimer's dementias, acetylcholine-containing nerve terminals are preferentially affected and therapy is directed to extending the surface area and duration of action of released acetylcholine. Cholinergic nerve terminals are also the site of action in the treatment of certain myasthenias and disorders involving compromise or excessive smooth muscle activity and exocrine secretion in the periphery. Carbamate and organophosphate pesticides act to delay the termination of action of acetylcholine by inhibiting acetylcholine esterase and volatile organic phosphates that have been used in terrorism incidents also act in this manner. All right, so there's a few things here. Um, I don't know if I mentioned before, but when you see the term cholinergic, that term is used for any neuron that, that um, uses acetylcholine as its um, neurotransmitter. And this enzyme here, acetylcholine esterase, or what we abbreviate as ACHE, is the enzyme that hydrolyzes the acetylcholine that is bound on the receptor. So it is responsible for removing acetylcholine from the receptor. And you'll see that reaction a little later on. Now what they're saying here is that certain pesticides as well as um, biological um, weapons have been um, developed to target this enzyme and to inhibit this enzyme. 
All right, so there's a lot of things going on on this slide. It's very busy, and fortunately for us, we don't have to learn all of this. There's just a few things I wanted to point out here, and that's this. All right, first of all, this is a cholinergic um, neuron. So it means that the, that the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. And all I want you all to know is that um, there are two main types of cholinergic receptors. You have the nicotinic receptors and you have the muscarinic receptors. And the reason why we call the, um, the nicotinic receptors that name, very good that name, is because nicotine strongly binds to it. And for muscarinic receptors, muscarine strongly binds to it. All right? And um, another thing I want to point out here is that nicotinic receptors are found on the muscle. So like for today's class, when we look at the neuromuscular junction, the receptors, the cholinergic receptors on the postsynaptic cell will be nicotinic receptors. Now for the muscarinic receptors, there are five subtypes. You have M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5. So there are five uh, muscarinic subtype receptors. All right. Another thing that we, I could throw out here and we will discuss a little later on is that for nicotinic receptors, they are described as what we call ionotropic and muscarinic receptors are what we describe as metabotropic. All right, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the subsequent slides. All right, so this here, um, this figure is showing you the events of signal transmission at a chemical synapse. And these are the classical steps involved in any chemical synapse. So let's go through them. So the first one, step one, an action potential arise at the axon terminal. So you see there's a wave of depolarization coming down in the presynaptic cell. And when that wave of depolarization reaches here, the second step happens. Voltage-gated calcium ion channels open. So you see there, the, because of the presence of an action potential, it, the voltage-gated channels, they open, and calcium, calcium ions come in. All right? As calcium ions enter the cell, it signals to the vesicles. Now, these are here vesicles, synaptic vesicles that contain neurotransmitter. And if it's a cholinergic neuron, it's going to contain a neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Now, acetylcholine is not the only neurotransmitter out there. It's just that we are looking at a cholinergic synapse for this, for this lecture. So we're going to be talking about acetylcholine a lot. But it is not the only neurotransmitter available. All right, so the synaptic vesicle then binds to a docking protein and the neurotransmitter is released, all right, through this, into the synaptic cleft where it diffuses and it binds to a receptor on the postsynaptic cell. And uh, this is the, the basic steps in any chemical synapse, all right? But we need to raise the bar a little. We need to go into some more details as biochemists. So let's see if we can add a little something more to this. So again, these are the basic steps for any chemical synapse. And it's a good description if you are at A-levels. Now that you're doing a -le um, university biochemistry, we need to, to give some more details about this transmission here. Oh, and one more thing that I didn't probably... Um, say right um, before was that the dog vesicles release neurotransmitter by exocytosis. So when they're released here, they're ex is by exocytosis and then they diffuse across to the receptor. All right, now the first thing that is not being described in detail in the previous slide is the synaptic vesicle fusion. These synaptic vesicles, they just don't go to the presynaptic membrane and this magically binds, right? It's, it's a lot of things going on. So a lot of things we need to consider. So let's see here. The synaptic vesicle fusion requires that, one, they recognize each other. So we're talking about the synaptic vesicle membrane and the membrane of the presynaptic cell. 
their surfaces become closely opposed, which requires the removal of water molecules normally associated with the polar head groups of lipids. Their bilayer structures become locally disrupted, resulting in the fusion of the outer leaflet of each membrane. Now we call that hemifusion. I want you all to get um, familiar with this word. Use this word here, hemifusion. Their bilayers fuse to form a single continuous bilayer. The process is triggered at the appropriate time or in response to a specific signal. All right, and so in this case, it would have been the influx of the calcium ions. Integral proteins called fusion proteins mediate these events, bringing about specific recognition at a transient local distortion of the bilayer structure that favors membrane fusion. All right, so again, this is some extra detail that we are adding to, to the steps that we saw in this slide here. So we want to add more details to this, all right? So what we are saying is that in, in this part here, what did it just say that the the um, the vesicle um, bind star docking protein. There's a lot more details we should add there. All right, so we need to talk a lot more about that. All right, so let's go ahead. All right, so let's talk about the fusion taking place. There's some sp some details you need to say there. So a well studied example of membrane fusion is that occurring at synapses, when intracellular vesicles loaded with neurotransmitter fuse with the plasma membrane. This process involves a family of proteins called snares. All right, now snares in the cytoplasmic phase of the intracellular vesicle are called V-snares. And that's nice and that's easy to remember, right? So if you watch here, you have the, the, um, the synaptic vesicle and inside the vesicle, there is the neurotransmitter. And you see they put two circles to represent that this is a, a bilayer, all right? Now, as they say here, in the cytoplasmic phase, so this is the cytoplasmic circle here, the inner circle, all right? There's what we call V-snare proteins attached. So V for vesicle, all right? Now, those in the target membrane with which the vesicle fuses, the plasma membrane during exocytosis are T-snare. So if you watch here, this is the plasma membrane now. So this will be the plasma membrane of your presynaptic neuron, all right, or your presynaptic cell. So the vesicle wants to bind to the membrane of the presynaptic cell. And we're doing that by combining the, the interaction between the V-snare proteins, which is on the secretory vesicle, oops, sorry, the V-snare protein, which is on the um, synaptic vesicle here, and the T-snare proteins, which is on the presynaptic cells. So these two proteins here will be interacting with each other. But there are two other proteins that are also involved. The SNAP25 and the NSF proteins are also involved. All right. So during fusion, a V-snare and T-snare bind to each other and undergo a structural change that produces a bundle of long thin rods made up of helices. All right, so you see here the long thin rods of helices here from both snares and two helices from SNAP25. The two snares initially interact at the ends, then zip up into the bundle of helices. This structural change pulls the two membranes into con contact and initiates the fusion of their lipid bilayers. All right, so let's see if we can get a little bit more detail from this diagram here. So you see here where it forms the, the V-snare and T-snare bind to each other, zipping up from the amino terminal and joining the two membranes together. So they're saying that when these helices form, that coiling action from the formation of the helices is going to, is going to um, join the two membranes together, all right? Zipping causes curvature and lateral tension on bilayers favoring hemifusion. Now when the outer, so they say at first it will be the outer leaflets. So the outer membrane of the synaptic vesicle is going to bind with the outer membrane of the presynaptic cell. And when those two um, membranes bind, we call that hemifusion. 
Because remember, it's a, it's a bilayer. So it's two layers of membranes that needs to um, be broken or to fuse, I should say. All right. So after there is hemifusion of the outer membranes, then there will be hemifusion of the inner leaflets of both membranes. So now the inner membrane of the vesicle is going to fuse with the inner membrane of the presynaptic cell. And when that happens, the complete fusion will create a fusion pore. And the pore will widen and the vesicle contents are released outside the cell via exocytosis. Alright, now the you might see in some textbooks where they'll be talking about um, proteins called like synaptobrevin. But synaptobrevin is what is um V snare proteins. And you might see in some textbooks um Syntaxin. Syntaxin would be um, your T snare proteins. So if you see those words, know that they mean they're talking about V snare proteins and T snare proteins, right? It's the same thing. All right, so now this here is a nice little diagram and it shows you what's happening in the neuromuscular junction. All right, so let's see if there's anything else. So, as I said before, when the calcium ions, when they come in, all right, they're going to phosphorylate the proteins that we just spoke about, the V-snare proteins and stuff. And that causes the synaptic vesicles to bind to the presynaptic cell. All right, once that happens via exocytosis, now the, the neurotransmitter, which in this case, if it's a cholinergic synapse, the neurotransmitter is going to be acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft and then it diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to a receptor. All right? um, the synaptic cleft is about 50 nanometers wide. All right? but when it binds to the receptor here, an action potential will be generated. And we'll talk a little bit more of that in the other slides. So please, what I will tell you how to do is pause the podcast and probably give this here a read. All right, this is a good read. It's is is uh, is everything that I've said before. But please give this a read. Now another thing is that they also show you um, certain toxins like the but the botulinum toxin. All right, I'll tell you the botulinum toxin. They interact with the snare proteins and therefore they prevent um, the hemifusion from taking place. You have a well-known toxin here called curare. Um, in the those, the Indian tribes and the Amazon tribes, all right, they use um, the curare to, for like um, poison darts and so on. So you see that they interfere with the um, the acetylcholine receptor. But what I tell you all to do is to um, read a little bit more about these toxins and how they operate. Now, some more details here is this, all right. The receptor on the postsynaptic cell, or in this case, the um, the muscle cell is, is an acetylcholine receptor, yes, but to give it even more detail, it's a nicotinic receptor. And this nicotinic receptor, because we are biochemists, we are concerned about the structure of it, it's made up of two alpha, one beta, one gamma, and one sigma subunits. All right, so it has two alpha, one beta, one gamma, and one sigma subunits, all right? That's what the nicotinic receptor is made up of. And acetylcholine binds. Acetylcholine binds to the nicotinic receptor and it binds specifically. It binds to the alpha subunits. So since there are two alpha subunits in the acetylcholine receptor, in the nicotinic receptor, it means that two molecules of acetylcholine has to bind to the nicotinic receptor. So for every one nicotinic receptor, two molecules of acetylcholine will bind to it. Now, when the acetylcholine binds to the receptor, the receptor opens. And when the receptor opens, you see this happening. All right? Um, sodium ions come in and potassium ions leave. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this nicotinic receptor in the subsequent slides. But I just want you to get a feel of it. So, when you're talking about um, transmission across a cholinergic synapse, you need to put in all these details. So the, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, all right, and that would be the receptor found uh, in, the neuro, in the cholinergic neuromuscular junction. 
So the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, and the symbol is NACHR, is a 290 kilodalton transmembrane glycoprotein consisting of a ring of four homologous subunits. All right? And the subunits is, um, is made up of two alpha, one beta, one gamma, and one sigma um, subunits. In the order, and you see they have the order here, alpha, gamma, alpha, beta, sigma. All right? The receptor is shaped like an elongated funnel with a large extracellular ligand binding domain, a membrane spanning pore, and a smaller intracellular domain. And as I said before, the acetylcholine binds the two alpha subunits. So for every nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, there are two binding sites on the, the two alpha subunits. So therefore, for each nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, you need two molecules of acetylcholine to bind it. And here is just um, a diagram of the, the protein structure in the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. All right. So remember, it's made up of two alpha, one gamma, one beta, and one sigma. So now, how does this, how does binding to the of acetylcholine to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor lead to an action potential? And this is what we will talk about now. So let's read. The nicotinic acetylcholine receptor functions as a ligand-gated ion channel. All right, so it's a ligand-gated ion channel. When acetylcholine, which is the ligand, binds to this receptor, a conformational change occurs which opens the channel. All right, so when we say it's a conformational change, you know what that means, right? It's just a, a fancy way of saying that the, the receptor, the ion channel, undergoes a change in shape. And this change in shape now will allow certain ions to pass through. And what we're saying is that it allows both Na+, plus, sodium ions, and K+, plus, potassium ions, to pass through. So both Na+, plus ions, rushes in, while K+, plus streams out. So Na+, plus rushes in, so it goes in, into the postsynaptic neuron, and K+, plus will leave, will go out. The Na+, plus gradient across the membrane is steeper. All right? Because here was, let's go back to this line here. If Na plus is coming in and K plus is coming out, then it, then somebody might say, well, but that don't make no sense. Then they will balance off each other. If if uh, if for every one Na plus that come in, one K plus goes out, doesn't it balance off each other? What's the, what's the net gain there? What, what effect will it have? But the thing here is, is that they are not going in and coming out at the same rate. The Na plus gradient across the membrane is steeper than that of the potassium ions. So what you're going to get happening there is that the Na plus influx will greatly exceed the, the potassium efflux. In other words, more sodium in a given time, more sodium will come in than the amount of potassium coming out. So what you're going to have being set up there is that the you all should remember what the resting potential is like, right? So the resting potential, so in the resting potential, what you have? You have the membrane, and outside of the membrane, you have it being positive. On the inside of the membrane, you have it being negative. That's a resting potential. Now, if you have a situation, now let me draw it a little bigger. If you have a situation where more um, where more Na+, plus, right? my drawing is not the greatest, where more Na+, plus is coming in than K+, plus that is coming out, what you're going to have there is that you're going to have a membrane now, all right, where it's going to get positive on the inside because more Na+, plus is coming in. All right, so you get a, a positive. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's simple. It means that the membrane, because of the influx of the sodium ions, the postsynaptic membrane is becoming depolarized. 
And we all know that once the membrane is sufficiently depolarized and there's a magic value, what is the, the, the specific value, the threshold normally for these neurons? That's correct. It should be around, it should go from minus 70 millivolts, which is the resting potential, to about minus 55 millivolts. And once it depolarizes about minus 55 millivolts, then an action potential will be initiated. And we carry on the process. So the question here now is, considering everything that we have just, just discussed, all right, describe the sequence of events necessary for synaptic transmission at a cholinergic neuromuscular junction. Now to really answer this question, you would have to bring everything that we just discussed and put it on in a stepwise way, all right? So you're going to need to take these three things that we discussed and put them together. So what you need to do is to get a pen and paper out, if, and, and I mean you should have had that out all this time, taking notes and so on, all right? And see if you can answer that question. So you, it means that you're going to be using this diagram here, these steps as your backbone, and then you're going to use the information from what we learned from this here, the V, the V and T snare proteins and so on. We're going to add that details into this, as well as the information about the nicotinic receptors and so on. From this diagram, we're going to add that into here. And if you add the information from these two things into these steps, then you have a very good answer for this question. All right, so now that we have the acetylcholine bound to the receptor, you know, we need to, to get rid of it. Also, where did this acetylcholine come from in the first place? Where did it come from? So you see here, once again, we have the backbone here. We have the basic steps. So acetylcholine is synthesized in the mitochondria. All right, now let me see if you remember from your um, basic biochemistry in year two. How is acetylcholine produced in the mitochondria? All right, so hopefully you know, said the right thing, which was, uh, I'll even go back a little bit more. In glycolysis, glucose is converted to pyruvate in the cytosol. We then take that pyruvate that is formed and it enters the mitochondria and via the link reaction, so that this, this is the link reaction, this is the reaction that will link both glycolysis to the Krebs cycle. So in the link reaction, the pyruvate is converted to acetyl-CoA. So acetyl-CoA is synthesized in the mitochondria. Now there's a, an enzyme in the cytosol now that um, called choline acetyl transferase that combines acetyl-CoA with choline to give you acetyl-choline. Acetyl-choline is, is packaged into synaptic vesicles. All right, and you know the whole drill from the earlier slides, how the acetylcholine is released. Now, when the acetylcholine binds to the receptor, it doesn't stay there forever. There's an enzyme, all right, called acetylcholine esterase, called ACHE, that breaks down acetylcholine into choline and acetate, and therefore terminating the signal in the presynaptic cell. All right, so acetylcholine esterase, um, breaks down. But I'd like to use the word breakdown in biochemistry, right? It just doesn't break it down. There's a specific reaction, right? And you need to tell me what reaction is that, all right? Is it a hydrolysis? Is it a reduction? What is it? Right? So when the acetylcholine esterase um, breaks down, well, hydrolyzes the, uh, the acetylcholine from its receptor, the acetate um, leaves, but the choline is um, recycled, all right? The presynaptic neuron will take up the, the choline and use it once more, all right? So here's the diagram that adds a little bit more information, all right? So you see here that the choline, it just doesn't magically um, go into the presynaptic um, cell, all right? It goes through a, oops, it goes through a choline and sodium ion transporter. So the choline that's in the synaptic cleft, it goes via the choline and sodium ion transporter, it enters back into the presynaptic cell where it will combine with acetyl-CoA to form acetyl-choline. All right, and in this diagram, they show you the glucose going to pyruvate from via glycolysis 
all right that's in the cytoplasm and then it will enter the mitochondria via the link reaction to form acetyl-CoA all right so acetyl-CoA removal from receptor so we're just going to recap what we just talked about there high concentration of an enzyme acetylcholine esterase ACHE are present on the outer surfaces of the nerve terminal or the prejunctional site and to the effector cell postjunctional site. ACHE is synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum, or you should even go and say the rough endoplasmic reticulum of neuronal cell bodies and major dendrites and is transported to the pre synaptic terminal membrane by microtubules. So that is something important. Eh? Remember, your cell body or your soma is what really contains all the organelles and so on necessary for metabolism and synthesis of biological molecules. All of that is in the soma. All right? So it means that if you want to get the acetylcholine and the acetylcholine esterase and any other proteins and enzymes and so on, that is synthesized in the cell body you need and you wanted to get it to let's say to the to the um the the presynaptic terminal you need to move that from the cell body down there and the way you do that is that by the use of microtubules now ache and again look the don't use the word breakdown eh? say hydrolyzes so ache hydrolyzes acetylcholine in the junctional extracellular space Choline, which is liberated in this reaction, re-enters the nerve terminal, the pre, which will be the presynaptic um, cell, and is again used for the synthesis of acetylcholine. So we we just recap in here, but we already spoke about it in the previous slides. Eh? So here you see they're they're being nice enough to color code this thing first. So in pink it will be the acetyl group. And in green here will be your choline group. So together there will be acetylcholine. Now ACHE will hydrolyze acetylcholine to give you the acetate plus choline. So it is, it's a hydrolysis reaction. All right. So we're coming on to the end of it. And the last thing we're going to talk about here is that acetylcholine receptors can be ionotropic or metabotropic. And I um, briefly spoke about it in the earlier slides. If you remember, remember acetylcholine receptors could be of two classes, nicotinic and muscarinic. The nicotinic receptors are inotropic as opposed to the muscarinic receptors, which are metabotropic. Now, what's the difference between the two? Well, in inotropic receptors, the, the neurotransmitter binds directly to the ion channel. So like, for instance, the, the nicotinic receptor that we just discussed, that's an inotropic receptor because we saw that the neurotransmitter, which in that case would have been acetylcholine, it binds directly to the ion channel. All right? So when a neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, the receptor will undergo a conformation change that will allow ions to enter and to cross the membrane. All right? And there's a rapid change in membrane potential. So this is a rapid response. Because as soon as the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, all right, which is the ion channel itself, it opens. Now, if you look at the metabotropic receptors, there are two proteins involved. The neurotransmitter does not bind directly to the ion channel. It binds to a metabotropic receptor. And what will happen there is that it will activate signal transduction pathways. And if you did signal transduction before, to be more specific here, it's going to activate G proteins, all right, secondary messengers. And what I'll do is that that will eventually activate this ion channel and it will allow it to open so that ions could enter, all right. This G protein um, effect could also modify existing proteins, all right, activates or releases gene expression. And that leads to all to a coordinated cellular response. So let's recap. Receptors for acetylcholine are termed the cholinergic receptors. There are two major classes of cholinergic receptors, the nicotinic and the muscarinic receptors. Nicotinic receptors are ionotropic receptors that cause rapid response in the target cell. 
muscarinic receptors are metabotropic receptors that cause slow responses in the target cell. When muscarinic receptors are stimulated, the response can either be excitatory or inhibitory. Ionic receptors are ligand-gated ion channels. When a neurotransmitter binds to an ionotropic receptor, the conformation of the protein changes, in other words, the shape of the protein changes, opening a pore within the receptor protein that allows ions to move across the cell membrane. Because binding of the neurotransmitter directly causes changes in the shape of the protein to result in ion movement, ionotropic receptors initiate rapid, so that's very important, it initiates rapid changes in the membrane potential of the postsynaptic cell. When a neurotransmitter binds to a metabotropic receptor, there's a change in the conformation of the receptor that sends a signal via a second messenger, initiating a signaling, signaling cascade within the postsynaptic cell. A signaling cascade activated by a metabotropic receptor ultimately sends a message to ion channel proteins, modulating the activity of ion channels on the postsynaptic cell membrane and thus altering membrane potential. All right, so there's a signaling cascade mechanism being set up here, the use of G proteins and so on. Metabolic receptors tend to cause slower acting changes in the postsynaptic cell as opposed to the ionic tropic receptors. The metabotropic receptors often cause long-term changes in the postsynaptic cell by affecting the transcription and translation or translation of receptors and ion channels. All right, so here in this diagram here is certain drugs that could affect the cholinergic junction. So you see here that the hemicholinium drugs, they, um, they block the protein that brings in choline. So they block the sodium choline transporter, the sodium ion choline transporter. Hemicholinium drugs, they, they inhibit that. So there's no choline coming in. Alright, Visamicol, that's a drug that blocks the, um, the packaging of acetylcholine into the synaptic vesicle. Alright, and then you have botulinium toxin, that's one of the most deadliest substances on the planet. That blocks the um, interaction of the V-snare proteins and the T-snare proteins, so it prevents fusion of the synaptic vesicle with the presynaptic membrane. All right, so a lot of things happening here. All right, there are other drugs that will affect or inhibit acetylcholine sterase. All right, some of them are used to actually treat Alzheimer's disease. Um, also, acetylcholine sterase is um, the target of a lot of bioweapons and so on. Also, um, insecticides and all of that. So there's some things for you to know. All right, now further reading. I want you all. To go and look at the mechanism behind curare as well as uh, physostigamine. Right? So look up those two guys and tell me what is the mechanism of action of both of them. Right? It may come in a test soon. So in the next class, we're going to be looking at neurotransmitters. And to be more specific, we're going to be looking at glutamate, GABA, and nitric oxide. Alright, so once again, guys, I really hope you enjoyed the, the lecture. I mean, neuroscience is a very interesting topic, and I hope you all are, are doing the extra reading because this lecture doesn't do total justice to the topic. Eh? So I want you all to be reading constantly, checking up different textbooks, check out other podcasts, and so on. It's really cool stuff. Alright, and as always, when you all listen to my podcast, you're supposed to have your pen and paper next to you and be taking notes all the time because the more you write the better you remember eh? you need to put things in your own handwriting if you want to do good if you want to remember and do well in the exam and as usual you know if you liked what you saw please show your love hit the like button as well as subscribe to the channel so you can get all the 
all the um, videos as soon as they come up they're going to come to you, you don't need to be um, have a YouTube account just subscribe to the channel that'll be fine alright so if you need to contact me please use the jmath2011 at gmail.com um, I would like to hear especially for those um, for the, the foreign students the overseas students the international students please send us your how you do things how you study this topic in your university all right, let's share um, materials and you know? I'd love to hear how you all do things your approach to neuroscience you know please give us some um, ideas and as usual guys you know um, thank you for listening and I hope you all do very well in your exams coming up and just give us feedback all right so until next time good luck and I'll see you soon take care